Hello everyone, welcome to the series Mud Talks, an astronomer's view of the periodic table of elements with Katie Pilachowski, class of 71. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event and we hope you and your family are well. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. Now, to briefly introduce our speaker, Katie majored in physics during her time at MUD. She is a distinguished professor at Indiana University Bloomington, where she holds the Daniel Kirkwood Chair in Astronomy and carries out research on the chemical evolution of stellar populations, including stars and globular clusters. She is also one of the recipients of the 2021 Outstanding Alumni Award, which recognizes impact on Harvey Mudd College as well as service to society. Congratulations. Now, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Katie. Take it away. All right, so let me unmute and um, say how honored I am to be here to speak with you tonight. I very much appreciate the invitation, and it's really a joy to share some of um, some of what I do with, with uh, fellow alumni and students and everyone who, who um, is connected with Harvey Mudd. It's a wonderful community. I will start by uh, sharing my screen so that you can see uh, there we go. Um, and I guess you can probably still me on still see me on the side. There I am. Good. Okay. So what I want to share with you is basically how astronomers look at the periodic table and what we learn from it. So come on. Uh, there we go. It just takes a second, I guess. So here's a periodic table of the elements. And it's been around for a while. A few years ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the periodic table of elements. And it's really a, a central piece of a lot of physical science. But I think those of us in different fields of physical science see the periodic table in different ways. With chemists, the periodic table is a way of building molecules, of creating new things, of understanding the interactions between different kinds of molecules, how they fit together, why they fit together, what their properties are as they do fit together, all the complex things that combinations of these marvelous elements can do. The physicists have a different view, and that is a view of the atoms themselves. That is, what they're made of, why are there electrons and protons, how are they distributed in the atom, how does quantum mechanics rule the structure of the atom, how do those atoms and nuclei interact with each other, um, lots of, of complex things that relate to physics. In astronomy, we view the periodic table in two different ways. One of them is a source of information about processes that go on in stars. Um, and another is, is a, a sort of a, uh, something we need to explain. So we look at the composition of the universe um, and we find a very complicated situation of the abundances of the elements, how much of each element there is. We have different sorts of elements in the periodic table. I'm gonna talk about these groups of elements, the alpha elements, the odd Z elements, and some of the heavy metals. And that will lead us into an understanding a little bit of neutron star mergers. This is all aimed at understanding the complicated structure that we see in the periodic table, particularly in the abundances of the elements. And I wanna start with a discussion of the sun uh, and show a couple of my favorite pictures particularly this lovely solar spectrum. This is a spectrum of the sun that was taken with the McMath Solar Telescope at Kitt Peak. It's a reconstructed from digital data, but it shows very clearly all of the wonderful absorption lines. So each of those horizontal stripes is one section of the, of the spectrum of the sun. And the little vertical pieces, the dark areas that are little vertical stripes are, are uh, absorption lines due to many of the different elements in the sun. You can see the circle in the top I've labeled hydrogen. There's a very strong line of hydrogen in there. The two sodium lines in the middle, the three magnesium lines I've circled in the uh, lower center of the image. Um, and our goal is to try to understand how, to understand the origin of these elements and why the sun has the composition that it does. And it wasn't until almost a hundred years ago that we knew anything about the composition of the sun. Uh, and that was discovered by this woman, Cecilia Payne Gapashkin. She was a grad, an undergraduate student at Cambridge and decided that there wasn't a lot of opportunity in England for her to continue her studies. 
And so she came to the US and undertook a PhD at Harvard. Her PhD dissertation is considered one of the most amazing, most impactful dissertations ever written in astrophysics. Because what she determined was that the composition of the sun is not like the composition of the earth. That in fact, hydrogen is the dominant species in the sun. So we can compare the earth and the sun here. I've made little pie charts showing the composition of the earth in the upper right and the composition of the sun a little below that. Uh, and you can see that the dominant elements, the most abundant elements in the earth are iron and oxygen followed by lesser amounts of many, many different species. In contrast, the composition of the sun is uh, about 73% hydrogen and about 27%, actually more like 25% helium by mass. Uh, and so it's really dominated by those two elements. And every other element in the periodic table is in that tiny sliver at the top, that little bit of 2% by mass of the sun that is something not hydrogen and helium. If we look at it by number of atoms, that means that 90% of the atoms in the sun are hydrogen, about 10% are helium, and significantly less than 1% are everything else, which we astronomers perversely call metals. Everything not hydrogen and helium to astronomers, the chemists will disagree, of course, but to astronomers, everything else we call metals in the sun and any other star. And it wasn't until nearly 30 years later that we began to understand, this was even before my time, we began to understand that not all stars had the same composition. Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin's results were considered very controversial at the time because everybody believed that the Earth and Sun had the same sort of composition. So uh, she, her, her first results were criticized heavily by distinguished astronomers of the day who eventually decided she was right, but it took a few years. And then it wasn't until the 1950s that we began to suspect that not all stars have the same composition. They're all, mostly all, primarily hydrogen and helium, but it was a study by these two guys, Chamberlain and Aller, who looked at what's called a subdwarf A star. So this is a star whose spectrum has a very few or very weak iron lines and relatively strong hydrogen lines. And they did a detailed analysis of it and discovered that its temperature wasn't anything like you'd expect from the appearance of the spectrum. And they concluded that these two stars were very deficient in all of the metals. That in fact, the, they had very low abundances of iron compared to hydrogen um, and all of the other elements that they could measure compared to hydrogen. Their paper was also controversial. It was difficult to get it published. The referees didn't care for it, uh, but in fact, they were right that in fact, the stars do not all have the same composition and that there are a lot of these very metal poor stars that inhabit the universe and that have a really interesting story to tell. So the story we want to look at is this, is to explain what we see in the abundances of elements. That why do we see this kind of structure? All of the features that I have, have plotted in this particular chart. This is a chart of the abundance of each individual species as a function of Basically, it's atomic number uh, going from hydrogen up. And I've just plotted here through copper, but we'll get to heavier elements later. This is on a logarithmic scale. So each of the major units on the y-axis is a factor of 100. So here we have uh, 10 to the 12th hydrogen atoms. And 10% uh, of that, about 10 to the uh, 11th helium atoms. And then if we look to heavier species, we see some very low abundances here. We see some odd, even uh, patterns here. We see another peak over here. Lots of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. We want to explain that. We want to explain all of the structure that we see as we look at the abundances of elements in stars. Where does that structure come from? Why does the universe contain predominantly this sort of mixture of elements? Well, we know that hydrogen and helium were produced primarily in the Big Bang. Uh, not much else, a little bit of lithium, and I've covered this bar here, a little bit of yellow, because about a one third, one tenth or so of the lithium that we have in the universe today was probably created in the Big Bang. But virtually all of the hydrogen and helium in the universe is a result of the Big Bang and the nucleosynthesis that occurred there. So we call that primordial nucleosynthesis. Hydrogen and helium were produced when the universe was very hot, 
um, and cooling and expanding. So its temperature was dropping, its uh, density was dropping. And as that happened, uh, it began, uh, nucleons began to survive and began to be able to combine. So we were able to get, say, neutrons and protons to combine to make deuterium without being knocked apart by being hit by something else right away. And this process extended up to producing some of the lithium that we have in the universe today. This big bang nucleosynthesis uh, is a little different than the kinds of proton-proton reactions that we have going on in the sun today, because it was an environment which was very rich in neutrons. And so protons and neutrons could combine fairly easily to produce deuterium. And then there were, was a whole series of additional reactions that uh, led to the production of deuterium. Uh, tritium was produced. Of course, it's unstable. It didn't stick around very long. Helium-3 and he helium-4, these two isotopes of helium were produced. There were chains that allowed the temporary production of some of these heavier species, like beryllium and lithium, but these were unstable in that environment and they immediately decayed or were destroyed back to basically uh, a, a deuterium or tritium nucleus, which then decayed to one of these others or, or, or back straight to a helium nucleus. And so the Big Bang produced only uh, the deuterium, the two forms of helium, and a little bit of this lithium-7 up here at the top. And those were the only things that the Big Bang could have produced. Uh, because there really is no path to producing heavier elements uh, in the conditions at the time, uh, in that phase of the Big Bang. So we can sort of figure out what the Big Bang must have produced uh, by, by, by doing uh, models of the nucleosynthesis that would occur in the temperatures and a range of pressures. So we know about what the temperature is because the temperature had to be set so that these, these nucleons could combine. Couldn't be too hot, couldn't be too cold. We have to, the temperature has to be what it is. But what we don't know is the density of matter uh, during this phase of, of the nucleosynthesis in the early universe. And so physicists compute uh, what the relative fractions of each of these isotopes should be relative to hydrogen um, at different densities of matter during the Big Bang. And they find that the uh, helium abundance is fairly constant, independent of density. Um, the deuterium abundance is very, very sensitive to density. Helium-3 is a little bit sensitive and lithium has a complicated re in, uh, relation to uh, density. Uh, what we can do then is measure the abundances of these elements in the universe in various places and ways. And, and that constrains what we know about the density at the time the nucleosynthesis occurred in the Big Bang. We can measure the abundance of helium-3, the abundance of deuterium, the abundance of helium-4, and in particular, the abundance of lithium. And, and from those things, we can say, aha, this is what the density was, plus or minus a substantial bit, but about that density when this Big Bang nucleosynthesis occurred. And so observations here tell us something about conditions way back uh, in the Big Bang. We also see elements from low mass stars when we look at the abundances of elements in the sun. And I've colored these two in particular green. These are elements that are produced primarily in low mass stars. There's some contribution as well from massive stars, particularly early in the universe. But carbon here is uh, the third most abundant element, excuse me, but yes, the third most abundant, second, uh, fourth, sorry, fourth most abundant element. Oxygen is the most abundant, but not produced in low mass stars. These two elements are produced primarily through processes that um, involve uh, carbon nucleosynthesis and uh, a special form of, of proton nucleosynthesis where carbon serves as a catalyst that ends up converting eventually carbon into nitrogen. And so we have uh, three, helium, three helium atoms combined to form carbon, and then the carbon becomes interactive and ends up uh, transforming into some nitrogen. So these two elements we can understand uh, from low mass stars, what the abundances are in the sun and begin to sort of tease out this pattern of elements that we find in the universe. The rest of this stuff primarily comes from supernova explosions. And this is a lot more difficult problem to tease out because the supernova explosions occur in environments that are very different from what we can reproduce in the lab and really involve extrapolations from known uh, 
known conditions where we can make measurements and, and, and produce uh, reliable theories. So we wanna understand all of the complex patterns that we see in these heavy elements and how they are produced in supernovae. So this is one of my favorite cartoons, just between you and me, where does the bread get enriched? And the answer, of course, is that it gets enriched in stars. So we know that elements are produced in supernovae, uh, but this process has been going on a long time and it's had a lot of interesting twists and turns through the history of the universe. So we start with the Big Bang. We produce hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, a little bit of that deuterium, you know, the helium-3. And from that material, we produce the first stars. So those stars are, have almost nothing else except this little bit of, of lithium. And we think that those first stars were probably very massive. So stars of tens to maybe even hundreds of solar masses uh, came about as the first stars formed in the universe. That has to do with the process of star formation and the ability of a, a, a collapsing cloud that's forming a star to actually cool, uh, to have uh, uh, molecules that can radiate uh, emission lines that can take energy out of the cloud that allows it to cool. Uh, so we end up with the first stars that become the first supernovae in the universe, these exploding massive stars that uh, produce these elements in particular. So they produce a huge amount of oxygen, uh, what we call alpha elements, the magnesium, silicon, calcium, titanium, some others mixed in there, um, and a lot of iron. So the first stars that we see, the, the, the oldest stars we see in the universe should have excesses of these particular elements uh, compared to iron, for example. And then with these new elements mixed into the interstellar medium, we make more stars and more other processes begin to contribute. We get different kinds of supernovae contributing, lower mass stars producing other elements, um, all kinds of more interesting things happening. And then as we move forward, we get the, the exploding white dwarf supernovae that I'll talk about in a bit, and even probably these merging neutron stars that play a role in, in setting that pattern of what we observe from elements in the sun and elsewhere in the universe. So what we really want to understand is how do we explain this pattern of abundances? And here I've gone all the way up to nearly 90 um, in the abundances of elements. Here's the hydrogen and helium that are so abundant at log abundance of 12 and 10, the lithium, beryllium, and boron down here at the bottom, the C, N, and O up here, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, some of these other elements, fluorine, for example. Why is the abundance of fluorine so low? Why doesn't nature make very much fluorine? Just enough for toothpaste, but you know, not really very much. Why is scandium so low? Why is iron so high? And then what counts for this interesting sort of wavy structure that we see at the higher atomic number elements? Why do we see a, a larger abundances of strontium, yttrium, and zirconium, lanthanum, and barium, and actually a little bit of a bump here for europium as well? What is it about these elements that uh, leads to this complicated structure of abundances versus atomic number? And this is fundamentally what we want to understand from the periodic table as astronomers. So how do we do this? Let's start with how. So we start by observing the spectrum of a star. And typically this is done at very high spectral resolution. So we can actually resolve these very weak absorption features. This one is only about 3% uh, deep from the continuum of the star. The little dots are uh, the feature that I wanna study. This very strong feature over here is a carbon monoxide a line in the spectrum of the star. And what I wanna do is measure the strength of this line and use its strength to understand how much fluorine there is in the star. Here's another example. This line is a little bit stronger. It's about 25% uh, deep. Um, so in order to, to get abundances from these kinds of data, we construct a model atmosphere for the star. So so the light, the energy comes from the interior of the star. It, it radiates out through the star through an outer layer that we call the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, the spectral lines that we observe in the spectra of stars, those ones that we saw in the spectrum of the sun are formed in that atmosphere. So we wanna understand the physical conditions in the atmosphere. What is the temperature as a function of depth? What is the pressure as a function of depth? What is the ionization, excitation of the atoms as a function of depth? What is the opacity of the gas as a function of depth? All of those things fold in together and we can, with a model of the stellar atmosphere, we can then compute what the spectrum should look like. 
and we vary the abundance of fluorine until we get a match. And that assumes that we get a, we have a good model atmosphere that we can do a good calculation of what the spectrum should look like with that model atmosphere and then match it to the observed spectrum. And this gives us the abundance of fluorine. So it's a complex process. We start with the spectrum. Wow, there's a lot of data reduction involved in the, in the getting to this point of um, seeing a, a nice pretty spectrum. And then the modeling comes in that actually tells us what the abundance is, what it has to be to produce the line that we observe in the spectrum. And that gives us the abundance of a star. Now my work involves particularly understanding the compositions of different stellar populations. So let me introduce a little bit about what a stellar population is. This is a, basically defined as a group of stars that have some similar properties. They might have similar compositions. They might uh, be physically co-located or, or uh, be part of a, 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 a larger stellar population. Um, they might be members of a, of a star cluster. They might be uh, these beautiful tidal tails from dwarf galaxies that are merging with the Milky Way and being spread out across space. These are also a stellar population. These stellar populations usually have fairly distinct composition traits. Um, they may have similar spatial distributions, uh, similar chemical compositions. They may all have the same ages. They may have some variation in some of those properties, but in some way, these stars are related. And so we want to understand the different chemical mixtures that we find in different stellar populations and what those chemical mixtures tell us about the star forming history of those populations of stars. How do those populations arise? Why do they have the compositions they do? How do they differ from other stellar populations? And so that's the fundamental question that I want to answer. And the elements give us the answers to some of those questions. So let's start by looking at the alpha process elements. These are the elements of even atomic number uh, that are uh, this particular part of the periodic table that include neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, and sometimes titanium. Titanium is a little more complicated. It, it's produced by a couple of different processes. Sometimes we consider it an alpha element. Sometimes we consider it an iron kind of element, but it's a little bit complicated. So all of these elements are uh, multiples of four nucleons, two protons and two neutrons. So they're all basically contain or the nuclei are building blocks. They're building blocks of the nuclei are these helium nuclei with two protons and two neutrons. And for the most part, these elements are formed in what we call the hydrostatic nuclear fusion phase in massive stars. So in very massive stars, we have a structure like this. It's often called an onion skin model for stars. The very center, it's the hottest and densest. And as we go out, Temperature falls a little bit. It's still hot and dense, but the temperature is lower further out and the density is lower further out. And so this, these processes of alpha process fusion take place in subsequent layers in this star. And deeper layers go further, uh, more shallow layers don't go quite as far. So we have an outer layer with hydrogen fusion and then an inner one with uh, helium fusing to make carbon and then carbon fusing and oxygen fusing and neon fusing and magnesium and silicon all the way down to the bottom where we drive nuclear fusion all the way to making iron. The kinds of reactions that go on in this environment are a little bit complicated. That, that onion skin picture is a little bit simplified because um, the reactions are not really just adding a proton to a nucleus. They actually involve a, a sort of a constant um, interaction between these heavy molecules where they knock together, they kick out helium nuclei, another atom might eat it, they might eat a couple of them, they knock together and produce all these different things. There's kind of a, an ongoing sharing of helium particles uh, amongst all these nuclei. And as the, as the temperature and density get higher, we see more and more complicated reactions occurring from the initial carbon and carbon producing neon and helium, all the way down to silicon uh, hitting, being hit by a gamma ray to produce magnesium, two oxygens producing silicon, a whole complex structure of, new, of reactions involving helium that produce these specific elements. Now we know that fusion stops when the atoms, the nuclei reach 
the atomic number of iron. And that's because we get energy out when we add nucleons to make iron. But if we try to make heavier nucleons, we have to put energy in. So once we produce a lot of iron in the core of a star, fusion stops. We're unable to produce more energy in the core. That leads to instability. Um, and the star basically collapses and then explodes. And the, these new elements that we've produced, so these even atomic number elements are basically exploded back out into the interstellar medium where they can um, contribute to new star formation and enrich the new stars then are enriched with these products of the supernova. The star can survive, uh, a star like Betelgeuse, for example, can survive on carbon-carbon on fusion into neon for about 500 years. But at that point, it's moving on to these heavier uh, reactions. And it will take about a year for a star like Betelgeuse to uh, use up all of its uh, neon uh, into oxygen and magnesium. It only takes a few months to make these heavier species into silicon, a few days to get the silicon back into magnesium, and then about, about a day for all of this stuff, plus helium, to move into heavier and heavier stuff, leaving everything in iron. So a star undergoing this kind of process in the core uh, leads to an end product about a day away from an explosion. And so these elements are important to us. They are produced in these kinds of stars. And we deeply do understand the process for the formation of these elements. So why do we care so much about the alpha elements, just aside from just explaining them? And that is because when we look at supernova explosions, we get different yields from different kinds of supernova. So the ones we've talked about already are the, what we call type two supernovae that are exploding massive stars. And this type of supernova produces a lot of these alpha elements and a lot of iron, and the ratio of alpha to iron is pretty constant, independent of the mass of the supernova. So if all we have are type two massive star supernovae, then the ratio of the alpha element abundances to the iron abundances, and I'm always gonna use logs here, uh, that ratio is constant as long as we only have these type two supernovae contributing to the mix. But there's a second kind of supernova, and that is an exploding white dwarf supernova. A white dwarf explodes. Uh, we actually are still a little unclear about how we can explode a white dwarf, but we know that if their mass exceeds a certain upper limit that we call the Chandrasekhar mass limit, then the degeneracy of the electrons is insufficient to support the mass of the star. The star uh, basically starts a collapse that triggers the carbon atoms to suddenly fuse all through the white dwarf and the whole white dwarf then explodes. This type of supernova produces a lot of iron, but very little of these uh, alpha process elements, very little magnesium or silicon or calcium. Um, and so, so as the white dwarf supernovae begin to contribute to the chemical mix in the universe, we see a change in the log of the alpha abundance as to iron. We see an increase in iron without a corresponding increase in the alphas. And so the relative ratio of alpha to iron begins to drop. And that point where it begins to drop, we call the knee, uh, where the type 1a supernovae begin to contribute. The location of this point where the uh, contribution of the alphas becomes less because of the type 1a supernovae contributing is an indication of the kinds of supernovae that are going on in a, a population of stars. If it's just type one, it will continue to be, this ratio will continue to be flat. As soon as the type one A supernovae start going off, we start to see a decline in this ratio. And this is related to the rate of star formation. If star formation is percolating very slowly, uh, then we won't have very many massive star supernovae before we start to get some white dwarf type supernovae popping off. If supernovae, if star formation proceeds very quickly, we'll see a, a lot of iron and alpha produced before we begin to get uh, any contributions from the type 1a supernovae. And so by looking at the location of the knee relative to the abundance of iron, we can begin to say something about, uh, about the, um, the history of that stellar population. 
So here's an example of, of how we learn about that. This is a diagram, uh, again, plotting the alpha to iron ratio. Again, this is a logarithmic form. We won't talk about the units here, but it's basically a logarithmic ratio of, of alpha element to iron versus iron abundance. We use iron as a, a proxy for time, thinking that iron is continually enriched in the, in the galaxy, so we can use it as a, a measure of, of time, um, time gone by. It's not a linear measure by any means, but it is a very useful way to sort of set a time scale uh, for this nucleosynthesis to occur. And what, I'm, what is in this figure, which I have taken from Wikipedia, is our, our data from two large surveys, the, Gal the Gala survey and the Apogee survey, which have measured alpha to iron ratios and iron abundances for hundreds of thousands of stars. And what we see here are basically two significant clumps of stars, one at the bottom here, uh, and the sun is this yellow star, is uh, one of these stars, of what we call population one stars. They're the bulk of the stars in the disk of the Milky Way. That's one of the stellar populations we wanna talk about. These other stars form a second population. We call them population two stars. And they're actually rather more metal poor than the population one stars. They're uh, more to the left in this diagram. And they have much higher alpha to iron ratios. And this is a population of stars which has evolved relatively high iron abundances without any uh, white dwarf type 1a supernova contribution. We can see how the knee begins to drop down here a little bit. Um, this is sort of when the type 1a's begin to contribute. But up here, there is no contribution from the type 1a supernova. And so by measuring these abundances, we really can begin to tease out the star formation history of the halo of the Milky Way, which is the, this stellar population, compared to the disk of the Milky Way here. And look at their time scales of formation and the, and the kinds of contributions that have gone in to the chemical mixtures we see basically as a function of time in the galaxy. So that's a huge help. The stellar populations are also seen in uh, globular clusters. So a globular star cluster is a very large ball of stars, almost all of which, at least in our galaxy, were formed long ago. They have ages from 10 to maybe 12 to 13 billion years. They're quite old. Um, and we study them in great detail because they have the most unusual chemical compositions of any group of stars that we've ever seen. Um, I've, I've pulled a plot here from a paper by Marino et al. in 2011 um, for stars in the globular cluster Messier 22. I hope many of you have seen this globular cluster. It's a beautiful one. It's up in the summertime uh, toward, toward um, Sagittarius and, and Scorpio in that direction of the sky. It's, it's not too far from the galactic center. But what we find when we look in detail at the compositions of globular clusters is that they contain themselves multiple stellar population. So for example, um, and I should explain, this is the same kind of diagram that we've seen before. This is an iron abundance on the bottom. These are a more metal poor stars and a little bit more metal rich stars. They're all metal poor, but this is a spread of about a factor of uh, two or so in the amount of iron in, a, in each of these individual stars. And then this is the element to iron ratio. So we looked at the alpha to iron ratio a few minutes ago, but here's the oxygen to iron ratio, the sodium to iron ratio, the magnesium to iron ratio, and the calcium to iron ratio, for example. Um, and what we find when we look at these, what we thought were simple popul stellar populations is they're not simple at all. Um, for example, we see uh, dramatic differences in the yttrium abundance. The more metal rich stars in M22 have more yttrium. They have more barium, they have more neodymium. They don't have more europium. And, and look at this tiny little difference here. It's tiny, but it's real that these stars have enhanced calcium. They have uh, on average a little bit lower oxygen. They have higher carbon, higher nitrogen. Very complicated changes in the chemical composition of stars in this globular cluster uh, in these two different discrete groups. And we don't know why. That's the frustrating part. We don't know how to make this kind of element distribution in stars. Here's another globular cluster that we've seen, uh, we've studied in um, with photometry rather than with spectra. And this, this is HST data. This is a color index 
um, in one dimension and a more complicated color index in another dimension. And this cluster, uh, we can separate that into one, two, three, four, five different subpopulations, uh, each population with a different chemical mixture. We don't know how to do this. We don't know what nature did to make it happen. We have some ideas that we think possibly this is this it represents multiple phases of star formation in a globular cluster with contributors of uh, other others earlier popular earlier formed stars that contribute these elements in different ratios. That could be um, evolved uh, intermediate mass stars, so five to eight solar masses that undergo some complex nucleosynthesis and proton capture nucleosynthesis that can produce variations in the element abundances or fast rotating massive stars early on in the history of the cluster have deep uh, uh, currents that bring material from inside to out and outside to in and change the surface composition and then stellar winds that blow that material away. So we have some ideas about how we can explain these globular clusters, but it's not as simple as it looks. And then we have the dwarf galaxies. So here's an example. This is the sculptor dwarf galaxy. It's at a distance of, um, I think it's about 40 megaparsecs away. So about a hundred thousand, hundred million light years away from us. It's a very small galaxy um, in the direction of the constellation Scorpius. And what we see in stars in this galaxy is very low alpha element abundances compared to um, the, the Milky Way disk, which are the blue dots here. An indication of very, very slow star formation having occurred in this galaxy. We don't see any star formation today in Sculptor, but in the past there was star formation, but it proceeded very, very slowly so that we, we didn't get a lot of contributions from, from the massive star supernovae and much more contribution from the white dwarf exploding supernovae. So we, we want to understand the composition of these dwarf galaxies and, and the composition tells us about their, um, about their star forming history. This is another, another example of a dwarf galaxy. This is Sagittarius dwarf, which is actually merging with the Milky Way at this time. And it also shows low abundances for these alpha process elements, alpha, again, alpha process to iron, uh, showing this, this different type of star formation history that we see in the Milky Way. And we can go on to Andromeda. And here it gets even more complicated. The, uh, the Andromeda galaxy companion, bigger, more massive companion to the Milky Way also has globular star clusters. And we can begin to look at those. And it's difficult to get spectra of individual stars in these globular clusters because they really are very far away. But we can get integrated light spectrum of the globular clusters and then produce models, not just of one stellar atmosphere, but of what, if we combine a whole pile of stars of different temperature, different luminosity, put them all together, produce a model of the integrated light spectrum, we can get some idea of the compositions of these globular clusters. This particular one that was studied by Sakari et al. is a, a composition study of the globular cluster G1 in Andromeda. G1 is famous because it's the first globular cluster ever identified to have a black hole in its interior. So it's an exciting cluster and we can be really begin to look at the composition of the elements in these Andromeda globular clusters this way. Uh, my, some of my own work with a graduate student, uh, uh, Zach Moss, has been looking at these odd light elements that remember the fluorine and the scandium that were so low, trying to understand the compositions of phosphorus, fluorine, and chlorine in Milky Way stars. Uh, Zach was the first person ever to measure the chlorine abundance in the, in the photosphere of a star other than the sun. So I'm very proud of his work. He's done a terrific job, but it's really hard what he's done. We have to go to a wavelength of 1.1 microns in the near infrared to get some phosphorus lines. We have to look at hydrogen fluoride at 2.3 microns to get a fluorine abundance. We have to go all the way to the much further in the infrared to 3.7 microns to get hydrogen chloride molecules and get the chlorine abundance. And what we find is an ex sort of an explanation for why these things are so much lower, the odd elements are so much lower than the even elements in this part of the periodic table from, from fluorine up through uh, scandium or titanium. They're a hundred to a thousand times less abundant than the even elements. And we would like to understand why it's so hard for nature to make these elements. 
it turns out that it's formed by really exotic processes. They are involved typically proton capture reactions that occur at very high temperatures. It takes a high temperature for a sodium or a neon or a magnesium atom to absorb a proton because of the high Coulomb barrier. Um, so, and, and to do this, you have to have protons mixed in at really high temperatures, and that's hard for stars to do. Um, so we need those proton capture reactions. We also see, like for example, in supernovae, that we get um, unstable elements formed that then decay and produce the odd elements in between. And in some cases, it appears that we need something called neutrino spallation reactions that occur during a supernova explosion. Most of the energy in a massive star supernova comes out as neutrinos rather than electromagnetic radiation. And the, those neutrinos produced in the core pass through very dense layers of that hydrostatic burning stuff that makes the alpha elements. And by passing through those layers, some of those neutrinos knock protons or neutrons off of the elements that have been produced, the odd, or excuse me, the even elements, and, and thereby produce the odd elements that we see. So we think that perhaps some of the chlorine, maybe even some of the fluorine are produced that way. The next topic and last one I wanna talk about is the heavy elements. Um, these are with atomic number greater than 30, and the only way we can make them is by capturing neutrons. That way the Coulomb barrier is not a problem, the neutron doesn't have a charge, but getting neutrons in a stellar environment is very, very difficult. There are some ways to do that, um, and I won't go into those in detail, but we find that there are actually two processes that, um, two sets of elements that are produced by these neutron capture reactions for these heavy elements. Here I've taken all of the data we have for the uh, relative amounts of each of these heavy metals from uh, zinc all the way up through uranium, and I've color-coded them based on uh, whether they were formed in supernovae or whether they were formed in low mass stars. And you can see some elements, for example, uranium over here is almost entirely produced in supernovae, where strontium here is almost entirely produced in low mass stars. We wanna understand a little bit more about this process. This happens through a process of neutron capture and then beta decay. Most neutron rich isotopes are unstable, if we get a heavy nucleus that swallows a proton, it's probably gonna be unstable and it will beta decay. So a neutron converts to a proton, emits an electron and a neutrino. The atomic mass stays the same, but the atomic number increases. Um, and there are two, two ways to sort of, two, two limits by which this process works. If the number of neutrons is very small, then the beta decay has time to happen before the nucleus eats another neutron. If the neutron flux is very high, there are lots of neutrons around, then the nucleus keeps eating neutrons and moving to very high atomic weight before beta decays occur. And that's what produces the two different types of, of, of S process and at rapid and slow process nucleosynthesis. So two different sets of, of supernova versus low mass star uh, heavy elements. So when we have a high neutron flux, the uh, the nucleons move all the way over to very high atomic number and then beta decay back to stability along this line here. If the neutron flux is very low, um, they, they stay very close to the valley of beta stability and we don't get a lot of these particular isotopes. We also know that some nuclei are special. Uh, if they have a magic number of neutrons close to closed shells like electrons, then they have very low neutron capture cross sections and we get more of those elements than we would if they weren't of those particular atomic numbers. And so that accounts for some of the structure we see amongst these very heavy elements. Okay, so some are produced mostly by uh, slow neutron capture like uh, barium here and strontium. Others are produced primarily by uh, rapid process like uh, the, heavy, the precious metals, uh, platinum, silver, and gold are predominantly produced by rapid neutron uh, capture. And some are both. An example of how this works are the isotopes of barium. So there are five stable isotopes of barium, 134 through 138. In the solar system, we see this mixture of the barium isotopes. In an R process production, this is the mixture we expect, and it's a different balance of the various isotopes that we get. For example, there's no 
136 from the R process, and there's no 134 from the, R, the rapid process. And that happens because if we produce a, a pile of, of heavy nucleons over here, and they beta decay back to higher and higher Z, we don't get very 134 because xenon 134 is stable. And so it doesn't beta decay and we can't, from rapid process, we can't get barium-134. Likewise, we can't get barium-136 here. And so we can begin to tease out exactly what's going on and where these elements come from by looking at the distribution of isotopes that we see in nature. I wanna, I wanna talk about one last little bit of these heavy elements because I find it so very interesting. And that is production of these heavy elements through uh, mergers of neutron stars. So back in, in 1974, uh, some of you were probably still at Harvey Mudd at that point, um, Hulse and Taylor discovered a binary neutron star. The two neutron stars were orbiting around each other and they could measure, one of them's a pulsar, and they could measure the, the periodicity of the pulses coming from the pulsar. They discovered that those pulses were coming more and more quickly, an indication of the decay of the orbit of these two binary stars. They're losing energy by gravitational waves very slowly. And eventually, uh, these two neutron stars will merge in about 3 million years. This was uh, an important con a confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. It was a big deal at the time, but it's become an even more, more exciting deal more recently with the, with the first neutron star, neutron star merger detected by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And let me play this chirp, which comes from the merger of two neutron stars in a galaxy far, far away. Did you hear the chirp? I hope so. If not, look it up on the web, you can find it. So this galaxy is at a distance of about 40 megaparsecs from us. It's not too far away. And also X-rays and radio wave, uh, spectrum were radio uh, emission were detected from this particular event. Um, here is an optical image of the event. So there, it produced optical light. It was detected in, in many colors of photometry. But I want you to notice in particular here when it was uh, first detected on August 17th in 2017, the bluish color. And then later, a few days later on the 21st, the color is distinctly red. The color changed as a function of time. So what we find in studying this is that the, um, the event produced huge numbers of neutrons from the neutron stars and neutron rich nuclei were expelled. And those uh, nuclei uh, captured free neutrons. They built heavier, very neutron rich material. And the, the light that we saw coming from the, that event, the optical light uh, came from the decay of these very neutron rich isotopes produced in the merger. So the object of uh, its spectrum very rapidly shifted from blue to red as these nuclei formed. They produced a large amount of opacity in the blue, which made it look much dimmer in the blue than it was at the beginning. And, and we can actually figure out how much material, how many, how much material in neutron rich isotopes was formed um, through this event. We do that by fitting models to the light curve that we saw, that is how did the luminosity of the object change with time? Oh, and that tells us that a 20th of a solar mass of material of neutron rich heavy elements was produced in this event. Even better, it appears that our solar system uh, is, is sprinkled with material from a neutron rich, from a neutron star merger. So sometime before the solar system formed, not very long, because a lot of these isotopes are short-lived, there was a neutron star merger nearby, probably produced a black hole, an accretion disk, ejected material. That material polluted the pre-solar nebula and was incorporated into the solar system as the sun and its planets formed. When we look very, very closely at the isotopes, the parents and daughters, and some of the longer-lived isotopes, in solar system material, particularly in pristine meteoritic material, we can detect the relative uh, abundances of those isotopes, parents and daughters, and get some idea of the time scale over which uh, this event might have occurred before the solar system formation and how this material was incorporated into 
the material that we have in the solar system today. And, and these authors concluded that there was a substantial deposition from a single nearby merger event into the pre-solar nebula. Likely it triggered the formation of the sun. So these events of neutron star mergers are really exciting and really are at the forefront of what we're trying to understand about the origin of elements today. So that's where I wanna stop. Uh, just to reassure you that we love the periodic table and that we really do begin to have a detailed understanding of the origin of the many different elements that we see in nature. And it's a fascinating story. So thank you very much. Thank you. Katie, uh, we do have a few questions for you. Um, let's start with, were any cosmic ray events measured during this neutron star collapse or collision? Um, I don't think there was any change in the cosmic ray flux um, at the same time that the merger event was detected. But remember that the cosmic rays are uh, our solar magnetic field shelters us from a lot of cosmic rays. Um, and a lot of them don't actually get, fortunately, a lot of them don't get here. And, and so, and, and the cosmic rays are, um, have their, they don't travel in straight lines. They are heavily, uh, uh, their directions are controlled by the galaxy's magnetic fields both our galaxy and other galaxies have strong magnetic fields. And over the very large distances that cosmic rays travel around galaxies, their directions are changed. And so it's very difficult to pinpoint um, the origin of a particular cosmic ray or even get a time scale that's got a small enough error bar to uh, connect it to that event. Thank you. Uh, our next question, how does your work apply to the study of dark matter? <laughs> right. So I have actually very little connection to dark matter. That's primarily done in, in work related to uh, galaxy uh, rotations to try to measure the amount of dark matter, um, to understanding the, the basically the amounts and the distribution of dark matter um, in the universe, in the Milky Way, in other galaxies, in larger structures. So I'm, I'm really just focused on that, five, that tiny 5% of the mass energy of the universe that's the stuff in the periodic table. I wish I knew more about dark matter. I wish I knew what it was. I wish somebody knew what it was, but we just aren't there yet. Thank you. Um, this is a clarification question. Um, did I understand correctly that the alpha and iron ratio can be used to date a star? Not an individual star, um, the, the date, but the, but the properties of the, stellar population to which that star belongs. So overall, the iron abundance of a star can tell us a little bit about its age. Um, there are better methods, however, that are more precise. Um, so iron is sort of tied to age, but it's not very precise. Uh, but there are other methods we can use to actually get ages for stars. Thank you. Um, why is iron the last element in a star that cannot fuse further? Um, it has, it has to do with the energy of the, so the iron nucleus is, is one of those special things. It has a very low cross-section and to, to try to add a neutron, you really have to push, push the neutron in pretty hard in order to get it to stick in an iron nucleus. Um, and so iron just, you have to give it some energy to do that. And, and so um, generally there's not that kind of energy available to actually make things fuse into iron. That's why the neutrons are so important, because iron is basically pretty happy to eat neutrons, but not protons. Thank you. Uh, we have Kayla, who's eight, would like to know where, um, sorry, I don't know my periodic table very well, but B, E, and B come from, since they weren't colored in your chart. They weren't, and that's a really interesting question. Thank you for asking. Um, we think that the beryllium and boron were produced by those cosmic rays. So uh, very energetic particles traveling through the universe often hit things and they might hit other, other nuclei. When that happens, because of the very high energies involved, they break apart. And it's very likely most of these cosmic rays are things like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen because they're so abundant. They break apart 
into smaller atoms, and they tend to want to make beryllium and boron. So we think that most of, the, of those elements are actually made by collisions of cosmic rays with other nuclei out in, the, in deep space. Um, the lithium is also very low, and we, we don't know entirely where that's made either. Um, some of it is probably made in nova explosions, different kinds of stellar explosions. Some of it is made in um, stars like the sun, low mass, intermediate mass stars. A lot of different opportunities to make it, but only in very, very small amounts. Uh, lithium is a difficult, um, a difficult um, element to make because it loves to eat protons. And so if, if you have any protons around and the temperature is above about 2 million degrees, the lithium will right away eat a proton and disappear. And so that's what makes lithium such a difficult element to make. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have a question. What can you say about the production of trans ceramic elements in supernovae events or neutron star mergers? So they are almost certainly made. Um, whenever the neutron flux is really high, it's going to push neutron after neutron after neutron into a heavy nucleus. And there's nothing to stop it from producing extremely heavy nuclei. But those nuclei, as, as we know from the experiments on Earth when we try to produce them, are highly unstable and they have extremely short half-lives. And so they don't actually persist long enough for us to uh, detect them outside of the laboratory. Thank you. So we have one, I know we have a lot of questions, but due to time, um, here's our last question. Um, what is this kind of research like on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, what are you doing all day? Oh, you have to love sitting at a computer. Uh, so I'm an observational astronomer. That means that I like to go to a telescope and I like to take observations. Um, and, and time on telescopes is very limited. Uh, there aren't that many big telescopes. There aren't that many places that, you know, we can get data. So I might observe maybe five, maybe 10 nights a year on a telescope. So that's a, that's a small part of the time I spend, but a very important part of the research. The majority of time I spend is in taking those data and doing the reduction to get them into a, a form where I can actually do the research I wanna do and then, and then do the modeling um, to get the results out. The exciting part of sitting in front of a computer is that I, can learn something that nobody has ever known before. And that for me is the most exciting part of doing the research. But the slog to get there can be, I don't know, it wouldn't appeal to everybody, but it, it appeals to me. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I wanna thank Katie for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up within the next week with recorded video and potentially presentation material. Uh, next, we do have Powering the Energy Transition, Big Changes During the 2020s with Brian Mull, class of 20, uh, 2000, on Wednesday, October 13th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We are looking for speakers for the new year in 2022, so if you are interested in being a MUD talk speaker, please contact us at alumni at agency.edu. Future events can be found on our online offerings page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hmc.edu and clicking on online offerings. Thanks again for joining us and have a great night, everyone.